conclude our stroll through um, this entire history and, 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 and uh, geography, if you want, of empirical spectral distributions. Uh, just to remember that we talked about the existence of the limit for the empirical spectral distribution for Wigner matrices. We talked about the fluctuations from this limit, so the fluctuations from the semicircle. And today, we're going to go one step further and talk about the minor process. The minor process is generally defined, as we will see in a moment, by taking overlapping Wigner matrices. Uh, and what this does, as we shall see, is it adds one coordinate, in a sense, to um, this description, this characterization that we've been doing. Um, and, of course, it complexifies the nature of the problem. But surprisingly enough, the answer turns out to be relatively simple, beautiful, and a nice generalization of uh, what we've seen up to this point. So, without further ado, let me actually uh, go th quickly through the uh, notation that we've been using. So W always stands for a Wigner matrix, WIJ. In general, up to this point, we've had just centered entries, and we had that um, the uh, variance of the off-diagonal entries is always one, and we've also had last time, and I didn't mention it here, the fact that the uh, um, variance on the diagonal uh, is constant, um, and the same for, for all of them. So these are uh, independent um, variables. Uh, we've been assuming, and we will start here assuming the same thing, uh, which is that you have bounded moments of all kinds. As we will see, and as, we, as, as has been the case uh, yesterday, this condition can be replaced with existence of four plus epsilon moments, but we'll see that um, in a little while. Pardon me, was that a question? Oh, okay. All right, so we're looking at the scaled matrix, so whenever you see a bar, you should expect that that means that the matrix is scaled. However, um, when the time comes, I'll specify something about the scaling. Of course, the empirical spectral distribution, as always, is given by the average of the delta Dirac functions at the eigenvalues of the matrix. Um, and we examined last time the linear statistic uh, for first for a polynomial and then for a smooth function uh, f. And what does that mean? It means that you average out the values of the function on the eigenvalues and subtract off the expected um, uh, value of this, uh, av of this average. So notice that we have two expectations, right? So we have, uh, in a sense, we have a multiple of the expected value of f of lambda, where lambda is one of the eigenvalues chosen at random. Uh, and then we take the average over the matrix W bar itself. Uh, if you particularize this linear statistic to the case when f is the polynomial x to the p, then we have the quantity that we examined last time, which is trace of w bar to the k minus its expectation. And I'll remind you that last time we showed that the quantity that I just uh, spoke about converges to a centered um, normal uh, with computable uh, variance. And in fact, uh, in the problem session, you were supposed to compute the covariance of two of these variables. I understand that you didn't necessarily go all the way. Uh, we'll see the problem uh, again briefly if we have time uh, in a more general context today. Uh, but the important thing um, to remember uh, is that essentially what you can, uh, the conclusion that you can draw, because you can calculate um, the variances and covariances uh, of this uh, process, and uh, you see that the variables, the limits, are always Gaussian, this is essentially defining a Gaussian process on the line, okay, uh, on, on, on smooth functions on the line. So you, you plug in <laughs> uh, 
a smooth function, you get out a Gaussian variable centered and with variance given by some function of that function. Okay? That's a Gaussian process. So, let's do a little bit of recap. The ESD converges to a deterministic distribution, which is the semicircle. In a very real sense, we can think of this as a zero-dimensional process, because this distribution is a point. Okay? So, you can think of it as lacking randomness. The distribution is a um, deterministic distribution. It's, it's a point. Now, then you look at the fluctuations. The fluctuations are defined by this Gaussian process on smooth functions on the line. That already introduces a one-dimensional uh, feeling. Okay? Uh, and then you can ask, is it possible to generalize this to something that's two-dimensional? Okay? Um, so rather than talking about something happening on the line, you want to look at something happening, say, on the plane. Okay, and the answer is yes. Um, we need to introduce a new dimension. It turns out, as I will tell you at the end, that we haven't quite 100% defined this satisfactorily as, as a proper um, two-dimensional process, but because of the quantity that is involved, in defining this process, which is the Gaussian free field, which I will define, you can think of it legitimately as a two-dimensional process. Okay? So that's, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to introduce this other dimension. And instead of having convergence to a point or convergence uh, to a Gaussian process, we will have convergence to the Gaussian free field. OK. So we're going to study collections of these centered linear statistics, so X sub uh, F of matrix, uh, of sequences of large overlapping uh, random matrices. So specifically, this will have depth and width, in a sense, because of the additional overlapping uh, constraint. Uh, this has been studied in the literature under two names, one of them being uh, the minor process, because what you end up doing is looking at a huge, well, an infinite array of variables and chopping off uh, principal minors of it, overlapping principal minors, and uh, studying the uh, centered linear statistics thereof. So that's one of the names. Uh, and the other one is corner process, corner being assimilated to minor in this context. Okay, so you'll, you'll find them in the literature under these two names. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to assume that we have this infinite uh, double array of variables. Uh, for simplicity, but it's not really necessary, uh, but for simplicity, we can consider them to be uh, IID off diagonal and uh, IID on the diagonal. Uh, it's a symmetric uh, array, so Everything is defined by what happens on the diagonal and above the diagonal. Uh, and we assume, again, for simplicity, even though you can remove this later, that we have moments, bounded moments of all kinds for the distribution that defines the off-diagonal elements and for the distribution that defines the diagonal elements. And we shall have that, so we have W11, W12, W sorry, W22, <laughs> W33, and so on, and then W12, W23, etc. But the, the only thing that we need to know because of the um, identical uh, distribution and independence is that the expectation of W11 is 1. Remember that the square of the um, W11, so the variance of W11 is 1. Remember that it's actually two. Why am I writing one? Sorry. Remem <clears throat> Remember that yesterday we just thought of it as a constant when we did our calculations with um, uh, the ways in which we could glue our graphs together and the like, and at some point a loop would appear and we had to square it. 
and we had to look at the weight that that gave to the entire term in the trace of w bar to the k. We didn't care what that variance was. Now we do. And the reason why uh, we will define the variance to be 2 is because this will agree to the um, canonical case, which is the Gaussian uh, orthogonal ensemble. This is what the uh, variance will be in that case. And we want to match the moments. The reason why we want to match the moments is that if we don't match the moments, we don't get the GFF. We get something else. We get other limits. So in this sense, this is a less stable result than just looking at the uh, fluctuation, because for the fluctuation, you could always get, I mean, you, you have always some sort of a Gaussian process. But in order to get from that to the Gaussian free field, it has to be a precise type of, of uh, covariance structure, which you can only get if you prescribe the moments. OK, is that clear? OK, so this is what we're going to prescribe. Uh, W11 squared is 2. The expected value of W12 squared is 1. And I'm going to write something. Well, I wrote there W12 to the fourth is 3. And you might remember that we did need the fourth moment uh, yesterday in calculating the fluctuation. And here, because we're doing something more general, you can expect that we're going to need the fourth moment. Again, we hadn't prescribed the fluctuation here but uh, last time, but now we will because we need this parallel with the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, and that's the, what the, uh, what the um, fourth moment is in that case. It is worth spending a moment, uh, no pun intended, to explain that everything that I've said to you so far about the empirical spectral distributions, about the fluctuations thereof, can be extended. And in fact, the custom is that generally these things are computed first for the Gaussian unitary um, uh, ensemble, and then for the Gaussian orthogonal and Gaussian symplectic ensembles. So those are the ensembles that can be obtained by taking Gaussian variables, Gaussian variables that may be real, complex, or quaternion. Okay? And this corresponds, as you've probably uh, learned by now in multiple uh, other um, mini-courses, this corresponds to a certain classification of these beta ensembles, uh, which has beta equals 1 for real, Gaussian orthogonal, beta equals 2 for complex, or GUE, and beta equals 4 for quaternion. or GSE, Gaussian symplectic ensemble. Pro probably unsurprisingly, um, everything that I'm going to tell you today is also extendable for beta equals, so we're only doing it in a sense for the, or, for the real case, so beta equals 1, but everything is extendable to beta equals 2 and 4. The only difference will be that we will want to prescribe the fourth moment to match that of the GSE and the GUE, and that means that we're going to have to do, instead of 3, we're going to do 1 plus 2 over beta. Okay? So that's, uh, that's a big difference if you go from real to complex or quaternionic. Okay. All right. So we have this infinite double array. From it, we will extract a piece, the upper left-hand uh, corner, which will be of size L by L. Don't ask me why we switch from, L, from N to L. It seems to have been the thing to do in the literature, so I'm going to try and follow that. Okay, so instead of N, now we have L as the biggest uh, size of a matrix. So we're going to extract for some large L 
a principal minor, the upper corner, uh, upper left hand corner uh, principal minor. And from this, which we will take to be at that point uh, its own matrix, from that we will continue to extract overlapping minors. So given some value k, we will extract k, um, k submatrices, k principal submatrices. By the way, I think that the word minor, unfortunately, in, in uh, linear algebra, is used to mean two things. It's used to mean the submatrix, and it use, it's used to mean the determinant of the submatrix. There are no determinants in this talk, so when you hear minor, understand submatrix. Okay? It's, it's an unfortunate thing. Okay, so given k, given some number k, uh, an integer, a uh, positive integer of that, uh, we will extract w1, wk, k uh, principal minors of this l by l piece of the array. Uh, we will have the sizes, the corresponding sizes, n1 of l, I'll write it as n1 of l, we'll see why in a moment, and k of l. And we shall have uh, overlapping pieces. So what do I mean by overlapping pieces? Well, if you think of this as being l by l, when we extract principal subminers, maybe one of them is in the corner, maybe one of them is here, maybe one of them is like this. Another one could be here. Maybe one of them is not really overlapping the others. And perhaps one of them even includes one another. Okay? So this, this can be a sequence of uh, um, principal uh, minors that we extract. Uh, and, of course, uh, in principle, we're going to be interested in the indices of the rows and columns that go into these minors. But in practice, if you think about it for a moment, you realize that rows and columns are interchangeable, subject to, of course, keeping symmetry. And therefore, in a very real sense, the only thing we care about is the, their sizes and how big the sizes of the overlaps are. Okay? We don't actually care about the indices. We can rotate these things, we can permute rows and columns to put them wherever we want. In principle, we could construct uh, submatrices that are not like this, that are not uh, contiguous, that are just a few columns here, a few columns there with spaces between. Okay? But because, um, because of this beautiful property of interchangeability of rows and columns, we might as well think of them as contiguous. Yes, I see there is a question. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Does it matter if you have the minors diagonal? Whether they include diagonal? I'm not sure what you mean because you have to the minors should be symmetric. So that's why you take them principal. Yes. 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 Yeah, but, um, but it doesn't matter. So we're only interested in intersections of two by two. Yes, so for example here, uh, if instead of doing this, maybe you had something like this, then yeah, you could have triple intersections. It's not going to come out in the calculations. Okay, so it's not. Um, because we will be working with Gaussian variables, Gaussian, a set of Gaussian variables is defined by, or a multiple Gaussian, that is the vector that's defined by this um, Gaussians, is defined by the covariance. And therefore, even if you have triple intersections, the covariance doesn't care about that. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions? All right, so let's keep going. So uh, I was about to define the intersection sizes uh, of pairs of these things. So we shall have n i j of l be the size of, I will write 
WI intersect WJ. And what I mean by that is the submatrix that corresponds that where W sub I and W sub J overlap. Okay, it's a little bit of abusive notation, but I hope that it's self-explanatory. Okay, so given this structure, we can examine the linear statistics of um, uh, traces. So for example, eventually we will want to extend this, but for now we're just gonna look at polynomials, and in particular because uh, polynomials are linear functions of monomials, and linear statistics add, um, and Gaussians add, um, it's enough to look at uh, what happens if you uh, look at centered linear statistics corresponding to polynomials x to the p1, x to the p2, x to the pk, where these p1, p2, pk are integers, uh, and you look uh, at w1 bar, w2 bar, wk bar. And I'm going to say something um, that's slightly different from what we've seen so far. Now, when I define w sub i bar, you might expect that what it is, it's one over square root of ni of l, w i, because that's the definition uh, that we have used so far. But in this lecture, because the, the true size is actually the one that I start with, that one uh, in the big matrix that I chopped off, I'm not gonna define by the uh, smaller sizes, I'm gonna define by the bigger size. So this is going to be one over root L wi, okay? In a sense, this will matter marginally and only in computing covariances because what we will actually want from all of these um, sizes is that they are proportional to L. So we will want that ni over L converges to some quantity bi, obviously gonna be in zero, one for all i, and we will want that nij of L will also converge to some quantity cij, again in zero, one for any ij, okay? So we're gonna chop off minors that are as big as fractions, fractions of the matrix, and their intersections are also gonna be fractional. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> Correct, otherwise what I wrote is complete nonsense, thank you. Uh, I think it was written correctly on the, on the slide, in my defense. Okay, so I hope that the setup uh, is clear. Um, because now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to define a height function. Uh, and this height function has a very pe peculiar, perhaps, uh, form and interesting. Uh, and that is to look without loss of generality. So again, by permuting rows and columns, in a sense, it's sufficient to define things for the upper left-hand corner. Because then, if you slide that um, minor along the diagonal, definitions don't really change. So we're going to define for some y greater than or equal to zero. In principle, we'll, we'll uh, only look for, uh, we'll only look at uh, y being less than or equal to one, but we can define it for any uh, y greater than or equal to zero by referring back to the infinite uh, double array that we started with. Um, it, we define the upper left corner of this array, call it w uh, sub uh, y. It's gonna be of size floor of YL by floor of YL. I wanted to write YL by YL, but of course that wouldn't necessarily be an integer. But for all practical purposes, you can think of it as YL. So the, as we know, asymptotically, floor of YL over um, L, as L goes to infinity, is Y. Um, so we define this matrix, and for any interval uh, on the real line, we define that quantity, uh, um, N sub, n sub i wy as the number of eigenvalues of wy in i. And in particular, we can define this height function x of x and y, which takes that interval to be an infinite 
um, uh, left-bounded uh, interval x infinity, and it looks at the um, matrix wy, so it's the number of matrix of eigenvalues of wy that are bigger than or equal to x. But of course, we're going to center this. We center it. Okay. What does this suggest to you right here? What is this function? If I were just to look at this. Or rather, okay, so maybe you can see it because I'm looking at x infinity, but what if I had looked at minus infinity x? The number of eigenvalues of wy in minus infinity x. What is that? The, yes, the integral from minus infinity to x of the spectrum, but so, so the, it's the distribution, it's the probability actually, I should say, is the probability that, um, or actually it's n times that, it should be n times that, n times the probability that an eigenvalue is less than or equal to x. Okay? But this now we're looking for our x to infinity, so you'd have to subtract everything from n, so it's a little bit more complicated. But it's a quantity that is deeply enmeshed with the uh, empirical spectral distribution. Okay, so we define this as being the height function. For a given function f, we recall what the um, variable x sub f wy is. It's the centered linear statistic. Let me change that pointer. And something very interesting happens. If you take f to be suitably smooth, continuous, compactly supported Lipschitz. You can add as many conditions as you want at first, and you can remove some of them. But, um, but say that uh, we take these conditions, you will see that the integral of f of x with respect to h of x, y, dx is actually going to be the linear statistic corresponding to matrix W, y of f prime. And the reason why this happens is that you can do integration by parts, and use the fact that h of x, y is going to go to zero as x in absolute value grows large. Because obviously, when x is minus a billion, chances are you won't have any eigenvalues. Um, actually, if x is minus a billion, then you'll have all of the eigenvalues above that. So uh, maybe I should not have put uh, absolute value here. I guess it's a, it's a constant. So as x goes to infinity for on the left, uh, so x goes to minus infinity, it's a constant. You integrate that um, and you get uh, um, the expectation is going to be n. So, so, so the number is going to be n, the expectation is going to be n, so actually x of x, y is going to go to zero. Does that make sense? If you look at an interval where all the eigenvalues are, and you expect all the eigenvalues to be there, then h of x, y is going to be 0. Okay? And when you go to infinity um, with x in the positive direction, then all the eigenvalues are going to be below that. You will expect all the eigenvalues to be below that. And so the number is going to be 0. The expectation is going to be 0. h of x, y is going to be 0. Okay. In fact, if you think about it, h of x, y is going to be a step function. Okay? Each time you hit an eigenvalue, something will happen. Okay? All right, so again, uh, let's look here. This is important because it, it codifies the relationship between linear statistics and this height function H. It's a very important um, equality. Okay. So the height, the height function as uh, I defined it is defined naturally on R cross positive um, real uh, axis or a real line. Uh, and we expect that all the places of growth of x, y in the x direction are concentrated in this domain. 
And the reason for that is going to be that um, the eigenvalues of wy will be in there in between minus two root y and two root y. Remember that we scale uh, not by root yl, but by root l. So the eigenvalues will have size between minus two root y and, and two root y, um, you know, with, with um, uh, probability going to one. And therefore, that's where we expect these, uh, the places of growth for h of x, y, uh, to be. So what we're going to do is we're going to map this domain here uh, onto the upper half plane via this map. You can take time offline and check that it works. <laughs> what it does actually is it's going to map um, semicircles into lines. Its inverse can also be computed. And we get this. You can see that um, y is going to be the absolute value of um, z squared. Uh, so this is a fairly simple map. Uh, and why do we care? Well, we care because, in a sense, this map will appear in a very real way. When we calculate covariances of these linear statistics for different matrices, in fact, this is the theorem that is kind of key to it all. And it says the following thing. So we have the uh, k um, uh, principal minors that overlap. They um, have sizes defined like I specified, and the overlap is also defined as specified. Everything goes to constants in 0, 1. Therefore, when you look at the linear statistics corresponding to polynomials, to monomials, x to the p1 on w1, x to the p2 on w2, x to the pk on wk. This should have been with bars, sorry. Uh, so I do want the scaled matrices. Uh, this vector of linear statistics converges in the sense of moments to a vector of centered Gaussians with covariance given here. And it's not a very simple expression. It's not particularly hard. Believe me, uh, if you compute the same thing for Wishart matrices, for those of you who know what Wishart matrices is, you'll get something more complicated. Uh, but still, it's, it's computable. Uh, and you notice here that I used the definitions of x of z um, that were given before. Okay, so I'm using, yes? Uh, no, that's what it is, yes. We just compute the moments and therefore, because we see that the moments converge, we, we conclude. I mean, for Gaussians, that's, that's what you need to do. Okay, so we see these expressions, x of z and x of w, and you can guess because they appeared in the, 